Good afternoon and welcome to the FDA One Health Steering Committee meeting. This is a special session where the Orsi Fellows One Health Pitch Challenge. So I'm going to get this meeting started and kick it over to our moderators where they're going to make some opening remarks. So let's take it away. And first we have Tracy. Tracy, are you ready? Yeah, I am. Good afternoon, everybody. It is um, so great that we finally are here at this day. Thank you for your patience. Um, this was so important to me that I'm coming to you live from the back seat of my car. Um, this is, uh, represents a tremendous amount of work by our ORISE fellows, um, the ORISE Pitch Challenge. And I am very happy to um, kick it off. And I'm going to turn it right over to Christine Leipart, who is going to walk you through the program. So Christine. Thank you, Tracy, and thank you, everyone, for joining us for the One Health Pitch Challenge. Uh, we are joined by four of the best and the brightest ORISE fellows who are going to be presenting their pitch challenges to you. And uh, I am going to introduce a couple of people who have been instrumental in developing this pitch challenge. They are Fred Mullen and Jim Lawrenson of Cedar, and Fred Mullen is also the president of the Association of Government Health and Environmental Scientists, AGES is the acronym, which until recently was the Association of Government Toxicologists founded in 1983. AGES promotes and facilitates the acquisition and utilization of knowledge in human, animal, and environmental health and associated regulatory sciences. Fred holds a DVM and a PhD in toxicology and is a non-clinical reviewer in CEDAR. So I'm going to bring Fred on. Hello, good afternoon. Um, when we decided last summer to organize this challenge, we had three objectives in mind. We wanted to raise awareness of the One Health concept at the agency, and especially among the next generation of our scientists. We wanted to provide an opportunity uh, for our ORISE fellows to practice pitching an ID to the leadership of an organization. This is not something that we do routinely as scientists. And finally, we wanted to help break the brutal isolation in which many of our trainees have found themselves after two years of COVID. I believe we have achieved those three objectives better than I could even imagine when we embarked on this journey last summer. And I would like to acknowledge here the 13 team who stepped out of their comfort zone to pitch their personal IDs to complete stranger. This afternoon, you will hear the four winners of the first round, and I hope you will enjoy their presentation as much as I have. Thank you again for your attention. Thank you, and now we've got Jim Lawrenson, and he is the immediate past president of AGES. He's the lead regulatory scientist for the environmental assessment team at CEDAR, which implements the National Environmental Policy Act and addresses emerging risks from pharmaceuticals in the environment. So prior to joining FDA, Jim provided 25 years of government consulting services, primarily to EPA, and five years conducting lab research on gastrointestinal physiology at the Yale School of Medicine. Jim? Thank you, Christine, and thank you um, to the One Health Steering Committee for this opportunity for AGES to uh, run this <clears throat> excellent event. Uh, I was very happy about the interest uh, in round one and the many submissions that resulted in the um, four uh, that we'll see today. So I look forward to uh, um, also uh, our watch party where AGES is going to uh, sponsor a watch party on the 16th. It's going to be a read broadcast of this event uh, when we expect to uh, present the results of today's uh, round two. So again, thanks. Uh, thanks to the steering committee. Thanks to all of the presenters. And thank you, Christine, who worked so hard on um, uh, organizing uh, this event. And back to Christine. All right, so we have four presenters for you today. And each of the presenters has five minutes to make their pitch, followed by five minutes of Q&A from the audience. Each of the One Health Steering Committee members have, that has an Excel spreadsheet that they will populate and score the presenters in order to, for us to be able to rank them in the first, second, third, and fourth places. So our first presenter is Jay, and he goes by Mike, Jay Z. He is an ORISE fellow in the Division of Quantitative Methods and Modeling at CEDAR, 
working on developing, developing physics-based models of orally inhaled drug products. Previously, he worked at developing models of bioprosthetic heart valves at UNC Chapel Hill and oral drug dissolution in human stomach at Johns Hopkins. In his spare time, he enjoys spending time with his wife and two children, cooking and playing basketball. Welcome, Mike, and we can go ahead and get started. Thank you, Christine, for your introduction. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for uh, giving me this opportunity to share my work. Um, so today, I will talk about development of computational modeling and simulation platform to accelerate the development of generic orally inhaled drug products uh, using One Health approach. Currently, we live in a world in which 9 out of 10 uh, prescriptions filled in the U.S. are for generic drugs. Increasing the availability of generic drugs helps to increase access to affordable treatment and essential medicines, especially for people in underrepresented communities or developing countries. According to um, the Association for Accessible Medicines, in 2017, generic drugs resulted in $265 billion in savings uh, in the U.S. However, in that same year, there have been no approved generic drug products for a complex drug device combination orally inhaled drug products, or OIDPs, which include these inhalers. Um, since 2017, only a few generic OIDPs have been approved in the U.S., and this leaves heavy financial burden on 27 million people in the U.S. with asthma and 16, pe 16 million people with uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, to receive proper health care. The biggest challenges in developing generic OIDPs are the cost and time of research and development. To overcome these challenges, we really need combined effort among scientists, centers, and even agencies, which aligns perfectly with One Health belief. Uh, one of the ways by which we could resolve this bottleneck in developing generic OIDPs is with computational modeling and simulation, which has shown successful precedence in, um, but not limited to, uh, respiratory drug delivery research. In particular, computational fluid dynamics has been widely used in several applications. Um, for example, it was used to study how aerosols are formed. Second, it was also used to evaluate the performance of inhaler devices. And third, it was used to gain new insights for developing new devices or delivery strategies. Using computational modeling and simulation, uh, we can develop OIDP models, as shown in these, uh, in these movies, um, that can potentially um, predict wider range of outcomes and narrow down a priori the number of experiments and also test various scenarios that are difficult to replicate or generalize in, exper in experimental or clinical settings, uh, such as impact of di different device design, disease state, or drug formulations. Uh, this is not only a cost and time efficient complement to benchtop tests, but it can also reduce the number of human and animal subjects studied in experiments, uh, as well as the amount of drug waste that are of serious risk to our environment benefiting humans, animals, and the environment altogether. Computational modeling and simulation has already been a strategic priority for the FDA, as well as for the European Medicines Agency for many years, showing increasing importance of this platform and also potential for global collaboration with these international agencies. To realize its full impact, however, uh, computational modeling and simulation uh, must be shown to be credible through verification and validation with experimental or clinical counterparts. So to develop a credible simulation platform for OIDP, my immediate goals are to first conduct a series of rigorous validation studies using both in vitro and in vivo data sets. And second, study the sensitivity of model predictions to various scenarios as well as the effect of device geometry on the deployment of drug particles. This is a two-year task initiation that has been actually approved for funding last month that will allow me to use the high-performance computing infrastructure already available at CDRH. The breakdown of this task initiation is as follows, which will eventually lead to peer-reviewed publications as well. This project will be a stepping stone to developing an innovative tool that could accelerate the development of generic OIDPs to help and help to significantly reduce the financial burden imposed on the U.S. population 
with asthma or COPD, which are especially crucial to manage in this era of COVID-19. And as you can see, this is impossible without the One Health approach, uh, in which experts from different disciplines share ideas to come up with a solution. The One Health approach is not just a one-time thing for this particular project, but it is actually the most important ingredient in achieving my ultimate goal, which is to bridge the gap between biomedical discoveries and translating them to clinical applications to improve human health. Thank you for listening. And I can take questions. Okay, we're now gonna to go to the Q&A. So at this time, uh, who would like to ask a question? Jim, you have the first question. Take it away. Yeah, hey, so um, I heard environmental. Um, I didn't pay as much attention uh, when we were doing round one uh, because I was doing the tech. But uh, I, could you expand a little bit more on uh, that and how this can help the uh, reduction in environmental load of pharmaceuticals? Yeah, so um, what I mentioned is that these computational and simulation platform it's not really a complete replacement of experimental um, benchtop experiments, but, all, but at the same time, we can use this um, to test um, different scenarios and also run different um, experiments uh, in silico. And we can sort of decide what range of experiments that we want to run. And that will significantly reduce the number of experiments that we'll have to run. And these simulations um, obviously don't require real drugs um, to be to be tested, so you can kind of determine how many uh, what different scenarios we want to actually test experimentally, so that way we can reduce the amount of drugs that are being used and wasted in testing in uh, in testing phase. And does, is there a All bioavailability right. component to this? Uh, in terms of. Um, do you mean like bioavailability in the body? Uh, correct, because I mean the lower, uh, the, the greater the bioavailability, the less is excreted in entering the uh, environment. Right, so um, it's, it's difficult to um, sort of for, so this determine how much of, of the bioavailability will be in the body um, without experiment or clinical test. Well, we can, um, for these OIDPs, we can look at uh, how, much, uh, how much of these drug particles are uh, deposited in different areas of the body and how much, are, how much is passed through these uh, upper airway. And we can sort of uh, predict uh, how much will be uh, actually go to the actual site of action and how much will be kind of wasted in the, into the system. All right, thank you. Next question, uh, Steve Solomon. I've unmuted your microphone if you'd like to take it away. So the question I had is, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, with the computational modeling, is there an estimate of how many animals or uh, human trials may not need to be done if we're able to validate this approach? Yeah, so for example, um, uh, that's a great question. Uh, for example, uh, we can uh, test uh, how much um, how much drug particles will be deposited in, for example, in the mouth throat area versus the lung area, and how much will be just passed down uh, into the system uh, with different different devices and also different uh, initial configurations. So we can kind of rule out the cases that will have high deposition into the mouth throat region because that's not a desirable uh, feature of uh, these orally inhaled drug products. So we can kind of um, narrow down to uh, different configurations that will have the highest deposition in the lung area. So that, that, that'll be the ultimate goal of the, using these uh, simulation tools, to uh, narrow down the number of cases. All right, thank you. Who else has a question for uh, Mike Lee? Here we go, Tucker Patterson. Yeah, Mike, uh, very nice uh, presentation. Uh, I've got a question in your write-up. You talked about uh, kind of serving as the conduit to collaborate with, you know, the pharmacologists, computer science, and trying to integrate uh, all of these folks together. So what would be your initial steps and in, in how you would go about that? Yeah, initial, my initial step is, as mentioned, to um, make sure that our simulation platform is working as, as we expect. 
So this will be um, initially um, we'll be uh, working with um, uh, a group, an experimental group who has a uh, in vitro setup, um, and we can directly compare our results to the experimental uh, deposition results, and also we can compare the uh, flow rate or the velocity profiles using particle image velocimetry from the experiment and make sure that our, our results reproduce the experimental results. So that work will be involving CDR or CDR and CDRH. Um, and then eventually when we can apply that to in vivo models or um, imaging models and also um, trying to test uh, different drug, par drug particles and composition, we can work with pharmacologists or doctors um, or also um, um, other, sci other biological scientists uh, who can give more um, insight in interpreting the results. So um, we, we, so my goal is initially making the platform, but using that and interpreting whether this is giving uh, useful information will be involving um, different scientists uh, to give us insight. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mike Lee. So next up is Nadia. Nadia Kadri is an OWISE fellow in the Division of Anti-Infectives at the Office of New Drugs, studying mic microbiological endpoints in clinical trials for urinary tract infections. So prior to coming to FDA, Nadia completed her doctorate at the University of Pennsylvania, studying vaccines against respiratory microbes. In her free time, she enjoys spending time with her pets and taking part in the sport called Olympic weightlifting. Nadia? Uh, thank you, Christine. So today I'm here to pitch you guys a project that addresses the danger of drug-resistant aspergillus. Um, this is a really common mold. Um, people are constantly exposed to it, so it causes about 3 million uh, chronic infections worldwide. Um, and people who are immunocompromised, that infection can become severe um, with more than 80% mortality. Um, and that's, we're seeing that a lot more often in people with COVID-19. And so we see about 250,000 of those infections every year. And more recently, um, we're seeing an increase in drug resistance to the agols um, that are used to treat aspergillus. Um, so recent data suggests that at least 20% of clinical isolates um, resist these drugs. And we've seen these isolates pop up worldwide. So this is really becoming a global problem. And so you might think the solution is just to find new drugs and stop using these agols. The problem is the azoles are also a really critical pesticide. They make up a quarter of the $19 billion pesticide industry um, worldwide. Um, and we're also seeing these pesticides contribute to our clinical drug resistance. Um, so what do I mean by that? So the problem really starts with the fact that azole pesticides are really critical um, for crops and landscaping. They're used to treat most of our major crops, um, especially um, also landscaping areas around hospitals. And so when these pesticides are applied, they end up naturally selecting for drug-resistant aspergillus. And right, so as people, you know, walk around, walk through these environments, they end up getting exposed to these now resistant spores, and they can actually end up picking up a resistant aspergillus infection, even if they've had no prior exposure to azoles and no prior treatment history. And so what this creates is a really clear pathway for the agricultural use of agols to influence the viability of these drugs in the clinic. And so really understanding this relationship, which I think will require a One Health approach, will really be vital to preserving our ability to use these drugs clinically. So I'm proposing a project that will take place in two parts. Um, the first part will help us establish the scope of this cross-resistance in the US, um, since we don't really understand it currently. So across hospitals, we're going to collect um, sets of matched isolates, and including clinical isolates from patients, and then also environmental isolates um, from their surrounding areas, so either agriculturally or from the surrounding landscaping of the hospital itself. And so to do this, we want to work with research groups that are already collaborating with CDC um, to start monitoring for resistant clinical infections. And so um, as a pilot, this will include UCLA, the University of Georgia, and then also the University of Pennsylvania. Um, once we have isolates, we can characterize the resistance to medical azoles um, and use sequencing to pick out which clinical isolates got the resistance um, from clinical azole use, and then which ones got the resistance um, from pesticide applications. 
And so this will help us get a sense of, you know, the scope of how frequently this is happening across the country. In the second arm of the project, um, we want to get a better understanding of how trends in pesticide use have shaped drug resistance um, both across the country and over time. So what we can do is collect geographic data um, across the U.S. to try to parse apart um, how pesticide use and agricultural practices have actually influenced um, the rates of resistant isolates. Um, and so to do this, um, we need to get really detailed pesticide usage data um, from different sites in the U.S. Um, to match with our clinical isolate data. And so that will require working with the EPA, um, particularly regional pesticide program officers, um, because along with local governments, um, they'll be able to help us get that really site-specific information. And so we can also take that and use historical isolates collected by the hospital partners we identified in AIM-1 to really paint a picture of how our agricultural practice over time um, correlates with shifts in the clinic. So I'm um, proposing a timeline of about three years. Um, this will allot us about a year to spend collecting isolates across um, the three regional sites we identified. Um, we're hoping to get about 300 isolates in total. Um, once we have those in year two, we'll shift to a lot of the in vitro work. So that will be um, doing short resequencing to characterize resistance genes and actually doing in vitro MIC determinations to look at resistance. Um, year three will largely be data analysis. Um, and then we'll also start to correlate data from AIM-1 with that regional pesticide use data. Um, and so really start to tackle those questions in AIM-2. Um, to break down the costs for you here on the right, um, our largest expense will be um, in year one, just because that's the year that we're collecting clinical and environmental isolates. So staffing costs will be a bit high. Um, we do anticipate working with those three um, university partners and hospitals to begin with. Um, so that will drive our initial costs up. Um, the in vitro costs, including the sequencing and MIC testing, are pretty straightforward. Um, so I would anticipate this costing in total about $760,000, um, so about two fifty dollars a year. Um, that being said, if we, depending on the insights that we make um, from this three-site pilot, we would hope to expand to more sites across the U.S. Um, and request additional funding to get a more detailed picture of how widespread this phenomenon is. So ultimately, this is a project that I think will really highlight the interplay between our agricultural and clinical practices and really help us understand what I think is an understudied interaction. Um, funding this project will, I think, improve drug stewardship um, around these as all drugs and can promote strategies that both EPA and FDA can implement um, to really optimize how we use them and preserve their viability. So thank you. I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, so who has the first question? Go ahead and raise your hand. We'll start the clock once I get that first question. Have you considered exposures from uh, importation of food? Yeah, so this phenomenon of um, sort of pesticide use impacting clinical resistance was first really well characterized in the Netherlands. And so part, part of the reason it sort of started being recognized was actually importation of tulips um, and flowers. Um, so pesticides were being used to kind of, you know, take care of the flowers, help them grow. Um, and as they were being exported, um, we were starting to see resistance um, pop up in places those plants were exported to. Um, so, you know, I think there's a definitely um, precedent to explore things, you know, imports and exports as well. And I think that's another dimension that we could add to this project. Um, I think for simplicity's sake, I wanted to focus on domestic production, um, just again to see what's happening in the U.S. first. But I think that would add a really nice global component to the project and really speak to how interconnected this issue is, um, you know, across countries. Next question we have from Robert is: Can you say more on how you calculated the costs? Yeah. So. I basically estimated the cost. Um, I anticipated about 300 samples in total. Um, that would be 150 pairs, um, so 150 clinical, and then ideally 150 matched environmental. Um, and so that was sort of based on one, that number of isolates was sort of based on what's been published in the literature as far as what would be sufficient. Um, so that's ideally, you know, 150 or 100 per site, excuse me. Um, 
And so as far as the in vitro costs, I actually estimated those um, just based on my own experience. Um, I have a lot of in vitro experience, especially working with pathogens and MIC measurements. Um, so I was able to, you know, have some sense of sort of what it costs to genetically characterize um, that many isolates and get them sequenced. Um, the sort of clinical cost um, was just based on um, like prior grants and sort of what it tends to cost to hire, um, you know, X number of clinical staff at each hospital, um, basically to be present for a year um, swabbing patients for isolates. Um, so that was sort of how I got that estimate. Uh, next question, is the EPA data that will be used publicly available? I think some of it is. Um, I think the EPA um, has data available broadly about where pesticides are being used, but the kind of data that I want is more, um, you know, exactly how much of this pesticide is being applied and on what schedule. And so I don't believe that data is um, publicly available for us to just look up. I think we would either have to, you know, use the EPA or local governments um, to sort of facilitate getting that information um, from farmers themselves. Um, or they would have that information um, for us um, to hopefully get access to. Uh, where do you anticipate resistance or roadblocks to implementation? That's a really good question. So I think the biggest roadblock that I could immediately anticipate um, is actually just collecting the clinical isolates. You know, I'm hopeful that we could get enough in a year. But one of the problems with aspergillus in particular is that it's often misdiagnosed in the clinic. And so um, there's this thought that perhaps we're even underestimating the number of infections. And so, you know, it might be that it takes us a bit longer to get a sufficient number of isolates or move forward with fewer um, than we would like. And I think that will be a really big one. Um, I also think another problem will be, you know, we know that some of the university partners, like I know the University of Georgia has a bank of historical aspergillus isolates because they have been looking for them. Um, and I know there are, you know, at least 100 in that bank. Um, but the CDC has only recently, in the past maybe five years, um, started actively looking for these infections. And so, again, the availability of historical isolates just might not be that abundant, and so that might affect how robust this analysis can end up being. All right. Thank you so much. And with that, we're going to go on to our next presenter. Christine, would you feel free to introduce? Sure. So the next presenter is Niall Cope, and Niall graduated from the University of Maryland College Park with a bachelor's degree in bioengineering in May of 2020. And so the past year and a half, he's been working as an O'Reilly Fellow with Dr. John Dennis at SDA's Division of Veterinary Scientists and Gotti Taylor at NIH's Signal Processing Implementation Section on Software and Hardware Development for Projects Related to Automated Animal Monitoring Systems. In his free time, Niall likes to cook and spend time with his friends. Niall, go ahead. All right. So, hello, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to be walking you all through some collaborative animal health monitoring systems I've been working on and how they tie in with One Health. And uh, my mentor for this project was John Dennis, uh, who oversees a lot of the FDA's White Oak Animal Program. So to start, I want to go over lab animal research and how it connects to One Health. So as I'm sure we're all aware, uh, One Health strives to find junctions between human, animal, and environmental health uh, because they understand there's a deeply interconnected nature between these three uh, health aspects, uh, and so far as to say that making any changes in one of these regions of health will fundamentally impact the other two and thus bring about an overall change to uh, global health. And since we want to strive for positive changes to global health, uh, it's important to understand this interconnected nature. Uh, lab animal research at the FDA is incredibly important for pushing forward this mission, uh, not only with improvements in animal health, but of course also uh, translatable improvements to human and environmental health as well. Uh, so, for instance, there's a lot of research being done in One Health zoonotic diseases of concern, things like Zika virus, uh, avian influenza, COVID, as well as other disease models that can be translatable to human beings, uh, just following that One Health mission, showing that um, uh, animals and humans aren't really all that different when it comes to our biologies. Uh, and then toxins, contaminants, and other environmental exposures, uh, seeing how they interplay is very important as well. And there's a lot of studies being done on temperature, light, uh, and other sort of uh, toxins and contaminants. And then medical interventions, things like drugs, vaccines, medical devices, 
uh, animal research is typically the jumping off point for a lot of those uh, experiments. Uh, and important for all the topics I just mentioned is proper animal behavior monitoring. My mentor likes to say that behavior is the ultimate expression of health and that the more we can understand the behavior of animals and how that behavior might change throughout the course of an intervention, uh, the better we can actually appreciate how that animal's health and welfare is changing given that intervention. Which brings us to our problem, which is the difference between ideal animal monitoring and the animal monitoring that we actually have. So ideally, we would have dedicated animal care experts who could observe each animal in each cage all day and night, which of course isn't very feasible. So what we actually have is a dedicated animal care staff at these facilities who do their best to uh, check up on each cage as frequently as they can, but these facilities get so busy, uh, there are so many animals there, and uh, most lab animals are actually rodents that are nocturnal, meaning a lot of their activity that we would want to monitor is occurring when we don't actually have any manual monitoring available. Um, in addition, there are a lot of investigator biases that can play a role. Um, some investigators might completely ignore animal behavior when looking at their study results, which we think is a big oversight. Which brings us to our solutions, which are these automated lab animal monitoring systems uh, that we designed from the ground up to be open source and scalable, dependent on the lab animal facility in which they're implemented. Uh, they combine hardware solutions for video acquisition and lighting based on the monitoring task at hand and software solutions for deep, deep learning and machine learning algorithms uh, that can track the animal and analyze their behavior. Uh, we've developed two systems thus far, thus far that we're really proud of. So this top image here is for our hamster monitoring system. Hamsters are a great model for COVID-19 as well as other human respiratory illnesses. And they're also very nocturnal, which puts them in that ca category of um, uh, observation where we don't actually have manual monitoring available uh, when they're most active. Uh, so these systems, which run around $2,000 per system for all the hardware, uh, allow us to fully observe the full length of the cage um, and observe the full activity period of these hamsters day and night uh, automatically. Below that is our mouse monitoring system. The mice are, of course, a workhorse species for uh, global worldwide uh, hypothesis testing, which makes them a very, very important species for One Health research applications. Um, these systems, which run around $500 per system, utilize a depth camera, uh, which is why the image looks as sort of groovy as it does here. Uh, admit they are, uh, it's great for giving us a reliable, consistent image of the mouse, uh, regardless of the coat color of the mouse and the bedding material or color. So we're really proud of our acquisition systems we've made thus far, but we're always striving to develop new and wider uh, application systems. Uh, and to do that, we need to solve the problem first of processing. So we're recording vast amounts of video data. Day and week long recording sessions can really add up. And with the goal in mind of real time data processing, getting behavior data in the hands of uh, animal care technicians as well as uh, researchers alike, we need a new solution. So what we're proposing is this collaborative cloud-based storage and high-performance computing processing uh, system that could not only cross federal organizational boundaries, uh, but also international boundaries, really anywhere doing this type of lab animal research. Uh, we, our goal in mind is to have in the next two to four years, have our open source algorithms used for tracking and behavior analysis, as well as our hardware solutions for acquiring that data implemented into various different facilities all across the globe to develop a worldwide uh, global scientific community to improve not only animal health, but also the humans that could benefit from that research and the environment that we all share. So thank you all for listening. All right, great job. Uh, again, any questions, you can raise your hand, because again, I'd like to have you on mute instead of, I hate having everybody type, but you can also, uh, on the bottom left corner, click on that blue box anywhere, chat pod will be there and you can type it in. Uh, but we do have the first question was, uh, in, re in reference to recording or long session recording, how do you anticipate continuing to keep that data and reshare that data, or is it just live stream and then gone? I'm assuming there's a recording portion. Yes, yeah, so it's uh, recorded um, and stored, so the video files uh, can actually be stored uh, either sort of on disk, on drive, uh, or ideally like this is proposing having sort of a cloud uh, storage system where we can stream the video data to the cloud. Um, the way that it's processed, uh, you don't specifically process the video files, you would actually be processing the frames from that video file, so we wouldn't actually have to store just the videos themselves, we can store them as individual frames, um, and then beyond that, if you want to get more technical, you can store them as numpy arrays, um, which helps to compress the data a little more and uh, save on storage space. But um, 
yeah, live streaming it could be possible if we move towards real-time data processing, but it'd probably be pretty inefficient if what we're really looking for is the behavior data. Okay. Are there any commercial available systems similar with the functionality that you're looking to put in place? Yes. So um, that's a great question, and uh, it goes back to um, something my mentor always talks about when we're putting these systems together. Um, and it's to design them from the ground up with the idea of them being scalable and open source. So there will be commercial products out there, but the issue is uh, that these commercial options, they typically are very, very uh, ruggedized for their one specific application. Um, they aren't built to work in pre-existing cages, in pre-existing racks that are already in these animal facilities. Um, you have to buy their cage, their system, um, and it's it's sort of just for that solo purpose. Whereas our systems, we build them from the ground up to be integrated into already existing uh, commercially available Allentown racks, for instance, is what we've been using for um, our mouse system as well as our hamster system. Uh, the hamster system is is in particular is interesting because they were uh, their cages are all ventilated. Uh, the racks that they're in are, are all ventilated again because they're doing COVID nineteen research, so they have to be totally sealed off. So we designed our system to go around those racks and around those ventilated cages. Um, so our systems, again, are designed with that open source um, and, and scalability in mind, whereas with commercially available products, you could buy it, but it'd be just for that one particular, uh, it just essentially be usable for just that one case that that company has decided is the proper case. Uh, what is the financial plan for this? Yeah, so um, again, so the systems themselves, uh, the hamster system costs around 2,000 bucks per, and the, the mouse system costs around 500. Um, but for the overall movement of that collaborative solution, um, our real goal would be to use something like Microsoft um, cloud servers, they're Azure cloud servers, um, which can run around uh, $13,000 for three years uh, for a petabyte a month, which is a thousand terabytes. Um, if we were to scale it larger than that, then it would, it would scale by that number. Um, but in, in my mind, our goal was to sort of push forward this idea of, uh, interconnecting a lot of the resources that we have available, not only at FDA, but also across organizational boundaries. So for instance, I know that at FDA, we have, um, Hive, which is a high performance computing resource. We have an HPC at, I think CDRH or CBER. Uh, which is also a high performance computing resource. We, we have even just within the FDA, these very high performance computing resources. And uh, my idea would be to essentially combine a lot of these resources. The NIH also has many um, cores for high performance computing and, and cloud-based storage. Um, so my idea would essentially be to hook on to and, and latch a bunch of these different uh, federal organizational uh, servers and, and uh, core resources for computing together. Uh, to save on costs, to utilize what we already awesome. have, and really push forward this idea of community. All right. Phenomenal presentation. Um, and thank you. That was our last question. So next up, we have Yoon Lee. Uh, Christine, are you ready? I am. So Yoon Lee is an O-Rise Fellow in the Office of Research and Standards Office of Generic Drugs at CEDAR, working on the evaluation of staccato drug platform delivery. As a pharmacist and a pharmacologist by training, she did various scientific and clinical research projects, including COVID-19 epidemiology study and formulary evaluation of CAR T therapy. In her spare time, she enjoys exercising, watching TV, and reading books. Welcome, Yoon. Thank you so much. So thank you so much, Christine, for a really nice intro, um, introduction about me and Thank you so much. I'm just honored to be in the top four like of winners for this one health challenge. So like um, the topic of my presentation is epidemiology one health study and evaluation of current available leprosy diagnostic test. So before I get started, I'm gonna share the one famous quote by Dr. Siegel, who kinda alerted the danger of leprosy outbreak in the US. It seems only a matter of time before leprosy could take a hold among the homeless population in an area like Los Angeles. So what is exactly like um, leprosy? So leprosy is an infectious disease caused by Mycobacterium lepra, 
and then it when it progresses, it can cause nerve damage and then lip de deformity, as shown in the picture above. And it is one of the oldest index diseases documented in as early as 1500 BC. But um, still, it remains as a major global health threat with about 200,000 new cases globally. And that's why we really need one health approach to observe humans and animals to combat against this major threat in the environment. So what would be the risk factors of leprosy in the US? So the three major risk factors include the immigrants from countries with high risk of leprosy, including immigrants from India and South America country, including Brazil, homeless populations, and last but not least, the workers, especially poor farmers and ranchers who are in closer contact with the armadillos, because there has been like a study that there was a significant relationship between armadillo meat consumption and transmission of leprosy. So why is this project so innovative? First, it's going to be the first epidemiology study to assess the risk of a leprosy outbreak in high-risk populations in the United States. And this project is extremely cost-effective by utilizing already established infrastructure because all we are going to do is just request to add a leprosy screening to already established health screening list from the Department of Public Health or academic institution that already offer free health screening to the underserved and the homeless population. So what is the cost of this project when being not approved? There's going to be incalculable economical loss for treating patients in case of a leprosy outbreak, as well as stigma and serious complication for all affected patients. Meanwhile, the benefit of this project is like enormous because besides being able to evaluate the actual risk of leprosy outbreak in the U.S. and prepare a plan to mitigate any potential risk, we can have immediate saving by providing proper care to the identified patient before it is being too late. So what would be the goal of this novel multidisciplinary and interprofessional study? So really, the goal of this project is to eliminate the chance of a leprosy outbreak in the U.S. by screening three high-risk populations for leprosy in the U.S., comparing the gold standard test versus the other leprosy diagnosis test, and tracing the potential source of exposure and providing leprosy care to all identified patients, and even providing the free treatment for all those identified patients. So this project is really like killing three birds with one stone. So like, um, to achieve this goal, we plan to have both domestic and international partners, including the CDSCO, the India version of FDA, and other European government agency. And the infrastructure to support our research will come from FDA, CDC, and NSDP, the government agency. And we, since it's actually an interprofessional study, we plan to have a professional collaboration with both the healthcare professionals and scientists as listed in here. So what would be the procedure time and budget for this project? So we have a three major procedures. The first procedure is going to be to admit the pressure to assess the leprosy, and then refer patient with leprosy suspicious lesion for the follow-up diagnostic test and thorough clinical examination at the certified laboratories by CDC and FDA, and we plan to collect about 5,000 patient samples, and we just refer all confirmed patients to get the proper care and treatment. And for this project, I estimate timeline to be around 3.5 years. And then I request about $2 million. And while this seems a lot, it is nothing, especially when you consider that one single amputation costs about like um, $50,000. So with that said, I'm going to share the one famous uh, like, um, quote by Benjamin Franklin. If you fail to plan, you are planning to fail. So even Benjamin Franklin must have been the health advocate, right? But let's take on action now before it is too late. So thank you so much for listening to my presentation. All right, thank you. And we're going to go to the Q&A. And I so, but we do have our first question, uh, Nicole. OK, great. Thank you. Great presentation. Um, there are several dermatological disorders that resemble leprosy, uh, such as mycosis fungoids and granuloma multiform. How will you address mm -hmm. these false positives to ensure accuracy in your leprosy case reporting? Oh, so that's a really excellent question. So thank you so much. So that's why, yeah, as you kind of point out, there are some dermatological conditions that can actually resemble the leprosy. But that's why, like, um, when, you know, um, there's actually the health screening provided, then 
the, my plan was to ensure at least uh, like a one healthcare professional who's properly trained to just uh, identify between the leprosy versus uh, like um, other like um, dermatological conditions. And then if uh, those uh, like um, he um, that um, healthcare professional identify that there's gonna be high, you know, basically it's like um, basically like um, high pos possibility of leprosy surface and lesion. Then we just kind of only send those patients for the follow-up test to ensure to kind of like um, between just like um, the proper individuals. But still, like um, the beauty of this project is that by even just providing health screening, as you have mentioned, we can actually also detect some other dermatological conditions for any enrolled patients, and then provide like um, some appropriate care by just referring them to the charitable clinic to get at least some like um, free dermatological cream or something. Actually, just uh, yeah, as a person who uh, had worked in charitable clinic, I always kind of like um, love to work with those underserved population. So that's what actually motivated me for this kind of project. Thank you. All right. Next, mm -hmm. next question we have is, uh, what are the current treatments for leprosy? Is uh, thalamide still <laughs> the drug of choice? Oh, that's a really excellent question, and thank you so much. And I'm guessing that question may come from like one pharmacist, like um, like me. So the major right now for the like um, leprosy treatment, it's actually a combination of a uh, like a um, multi-drug combination. So that's why while like um, rifampicin is still the major one, then um, based on the recent data by WHO, there has been a um, concern of the like um, antibody resistance of uh, like um issue for so that's why besides rebampicin the other alternative therapy could be like um clopazine and then some other antibody treatment. But then just uh, one important thing is that for most of the like um, guideline I led, they actually request um recommend at least six months to like um, one year therapy to really ensure that you know the like um, things are treated. And then yeah, it's also true that compared to bacteria, fungal infections are harder to treat so that's why that basically requires a longer like uh, monitoring and then duration of therapy. So thank you so much for that excellent question. Okay. Uh, next question we have is, I might have missed it, but what is the prevalence of leprosy in the U.S. now? Oh, that's a really excellent, another excellent question. So like uh, right now, it actually kind of changes, but then it can be sometime between 150 to 300 cases per year. While this one seems low, but I also wanted to bring one case from India. So basically in India in 2005, people actually thought that the, like, um, they could really like, um, get closer to eradicate the leprosy because they had less than one to 10,000 like, um, leprosy cases. But then for one year, that when they just did a special like um campaign called the leprosy case detection campaign to really like um outreach to those underserved communities as well as really kind of like um just taking the endemic region, they just found just like um thirty five thousand new cases for that specific year, the first year that they started that campaign. So that's why like um I just like um think that especially like um. Right now, currently, for leprosy detection, it's more like by accidental. So, for example, for the charitable clinic that I used to work, so there was one um, patient who visited our clinic, and then if there was no dermatologist who was actually on the site, and then at least kind of requested to send a sample for further like um test, then I don't think like um that we could detect the leprosy case we would pretty much assume that, oh, the patient would have a diabetic neuropathy or some other issues, but then, so that's the, what the reality kind of hit me that there's more need to really like, um, do like a um, thorough epidemiology study, really targeting those underserved population. So that's why I just think that this project is kind of worth it. All right, we have one more question, which is, how can government prevent this screening from being misused to keep individuals from certain countries out, such as, you know, racial profiling, et cetera? Um, so if I understood the question correctly, like, um, what kind of uh, approach can be used to kind of, like, um, to prevent missing those, like, um, leprosy cases at the beginning? Is that the what the question is, I, I'm so sorry, just to like, um, 
So uh, I will see that I could understand your question properly. But um, I think one approach that government could do is that um, so just uh, for the like um, basically trying to just uh, like um, think about immigrants who are just uh, from the high risk country or regions, and then for like um, them they just uh, to kind of request the like um, optional like um, screening. Because it's true that even like um, for me, like uh, when I just came to the U.S. first, that we actually had to turn in some like um, health screening that actually had to be checked by the physician. But then at least like um, from my memory, I don't remember anything related with the dermatological condition screening. So that's why yeah, one thing that government can do to prevent missing those like um, leprosy um, cases uh, like um, from those uh, immigrants is uh, like um, maybe just uh, try to identify that high-risk population or high-risk immigrant, and then just uh, have the like, um, additional dermatological screen um, kind of like, um, submitted or something like that. So I hope that actually addressed the, your question. I'm so sorry if I couldn't understand your question properly. <laughs> All right, and thank you so much. Uh, that seems to be the last question, and we're at the end of the meeting, so I'm going to hand it back to Christine. Christine, are you there? Yes, thank you so much for the excellent presentations from the O-RISE Fellows and for the One Health Steering Committee members serving as judges for today's panel. We ask that the One Health Steering Committee members send your spreadsheets to Christine Leipart, Fred Mullen, and Jim Lawrenson by March 14th. Thank you also to the chairs of the One Health Steering Committee, Dr. Steve Solomon and Jackie O'Shaughnessy for making this possible and for supporting One Health and using multidisciplinary approach that benefits animals, humans, and the environment. Thank you all and have a great week. Bye-bye.